Hello, everyone. My name is Olga Rosales Salinas, and I'm here to present San Francisco Bay Area Moms Bloom Event and Expert Panel. Our Bloom Event is here to support new and expecting moms. So thank you so much, mom. Thank you, new and expecting mom, for joining us and for tuning in for this panel, for this panel especially. Today on the panel, we have Robin Enan. Robin is a clinical therapist trainee at Almaden Valley Counseling Services in San Jose, working currently at Bret Hart Middle School. Hi, thank you for joining us. Hi, Olga. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us about your background, um, your, your work before you became a clinical therapist trainee, and um, how you got to where you are. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So my first uh my first career was actually in journalism. Um, I, yeah, I started off um, straight out of college. I got a master's degree in journalism in New York City at Columbia and uh, was able to work covering the United Nations and politics and moved back to my native Bay Area and was able to uh, work in San Francisco and Sacramento for a while, mostly again covering politics at the state and local levels. And once I started having my kids, I am fortunate I have three kids. Um, they're all in elementary school, but when they were first coming and, and babies and at home, the the journalism travel at a moment's notice, follow the breaking news lifestyle was not really a match for me in terms of kind of how I wanted to be a presence for, for my little kids. And I got to thinking um, as they were all approaching elementary school age and we were going to have one drop off, um, you know, sort of what's the next chapter for me going to look like. And um, I think I mentioned to you earlier, we sort of have these paths that weren't taken and sometimes we get to revisit them. And for me, that was psychology. And in 2020, I started a master's program that's all online through Pepperdine University in clinical psychology. So I'm wrapping that up in December of this year. And along with that comes a year of clinical training, which I've been doing since January, as you mentioned, down uh, at a middle school called Bret Hart in San Jose. And that has been I, I was placed there um, because of my schedule availability, my geographic location, and I feel like all the stars were aligned. I might not have self-selected to be in a middle school, and I think I've been so inspired by that work and think especially kind of moving on out of the back end of the pandemic, it is vital to really be reaching out to that adolescent population. So... <laughs> You have a nine, eight, and five-year-old? I do. Okay, so officially one one drop-off. Officially one drop-off. The That's youngest is exciting. in kindergarten this year. So we, we did a little celebration dance yeah. when that happened. Um, that is awesome. I'm happy for you. I also have one drop-off, and it's it's great. It's um, I guess my question is, what is what's the current state of middle school like? You mentioned not self-selecting there, but now that you're there, what are you looking at when you look at middle schoolers? Absolutely. I mean, that's such a hard age anyway, without the pandemic and without, you know. Yeah, it's such a time period of identity exploration. I think we all can relate to that. We've all been sort of that ages 11 through 13 and kind of trying to figure out who we are, independent of maybe who our parents think we are, and navigating different social dynamics. And I think, you know, for this crop of middle schoolers that's currently in middle school, you think about it for so many of them, the pandemic pulled them out of full-time school in late elementary school and sort of spit them back out after a period of Zoom school. And suddenly they're they're middle schoolers and it's a totally different kind of environment. Their bodies are changing. Their brains are kind of rewiring themselves. So I, I do see what I feel is pretty typical for that age, meaning um, a lot of struggles with anxiety, depression, um, some maybe difficult transitions that are happening at home, like uh, parents who are separating or going through a divorce, um, a, a grandparent who they're particularly close with who might... Um, be ill or have passed away. And then I'm seeing a lot of adjustments related to, I think, this particular moment in time that we're living in, which is 
maybe some social situations that that age group would have figured out already. They they had a gap of really missing that in-person interaction. And now they're back in it with high intensity. And I, I'm seeing a lot of panic attacks among kids, um, a lot of pressure that they put on themselves, both academically and socially and in terms of their appearance. Um, and unfortunately, I do see a fair amount of um, kind of unhealthy coping strategies, whether that's related to experimentation with vaping or marijuana or some self-harm behavior as a coping strategy. So yeah, it can it can get it can get pretty tough, but again, I like to think that the best thing to do for that age is really give them sort of a supportive person to talk to, somebody who is there just to listen to them, doesn't report back to teachers, doesn't report back to parents, is really there to just kind of hear them out and their concerns. So that's what I try to be. Okay, so this isn't particularly for new and expecting moms, although it can be um, just like future looking in. But now that I have you and you mentioned middle school and that's where you currently are, I'm really curious if this school in particular and, and maybe other schools in the broader San Jose area, um, in Bay Area really, um, how often you guys have shooter active shooter drills and how the students and the parents process that experience. Do it twice a year, so once a year, like yeah, that's that lead up to panic attacks because I experienced them <laughs> just when it happens anywhere near me. So I I'm curious because you're in the you're in it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And I'm really, really unfortunate that that's kind of part of the standard school protocol. I believe um, at the school that I'm at, and I think this is true um, for many of the schools, at least middle schools and high schools in San Jose Unified, um, I believe it's, it's twice a year. And then there's um, also sort of information provided to faculty and staff more in written form in terms of the handbook and guidelines of sort of procedures to follow. And it it, it does it. I, I feel on the one hand, preparedness is a great thing. And right. on the other hand, yeah, what does that contribute to mounting anxiety and someone thinking, well, my gosh, is this something I should be actively worrying about every day as they come to school, whether you're a student, a staff member, or a parent who's sending your kids off to school? Right. I mean, it's so intense, right? Um, mm -hmm. I remember a psychology professor saying that the 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 further we go down and the, the more of these that we have, we're just going to have to start putting medication in the water because <laughs> everyone is going to be anxious. But that's the side of the way. We're here for new and expecting moms. <laughs> Thank you for letting me go down that train of thought. But Absolutely. what advice do you have um, for new and expecting moms, uh, especially the ones that are going to be at our Bloom event on Saturday, um, that you think they might benefit from? What What does a new and expecting mom, what should they know about their mental health? You know, I would say, so um, I think... I, everyone's circumstances are so different. Every Everyone's road to motherhood has been so different. And sometimes, you know, we're talking sometimes about, as you said, new moms, sometimes expecting moms who maybe already have a, a child or more than one child at home. I, I'd say for me, one thing that I have found um, is sort of advice I would give across the board is just um, to kind of... Uh, limit as much as you can how much information you're letting come in when it comes to other people's views on, you know, how you should be doing pregnancy, how you should be doing the newborn stage. Um, I think unsolicited advice seems to come in from, from all over the place. And, and truly, sometimes it it just comes with the best of intentions and much of it can be useful, maybe even just tucked away in the back of your brain for possible future use. But some of it, I feel it can really make you start to question your own gut instincts with your own child. And I, I think the, the more we can kind of 
stay receptive to what our own bodies and brains and instincts are telling us with our babies, I I think that's not going to steer you wrong. That being said, there's a lot of great expert resources out there. So if you're struggling with something or really feel like, I I just don't know where, where to turn. I mean, absolutely use, whether it's lactation consultants or, you know, looking on on reputable parenting websites and maybe, maybe not the Google deep dive that can take us in strange directions, but, you know, asking the pediatrician, asking a mom friend who's kind of done it all before those things are all great. But I think um, it can be very hard as a first time mom to feel like you can trust your gut because you think, well, I haven't done this before. What if I'm going to totally screw this up? And I just really think like that instinct is almost always going to serve you better than kind of that. The, the peanut gallery. <laughs> the peanut gallery is right. Or even if your second, if my second kid, I was also as I felt just as desperate. <laughs> like, am I going to do this? You know? Yeah, um, absolutely. It doesn't necessarily go away after that mm-hmm. first one because then you're saying, how do I do a baby and a toddler or and a, you know, five year old, whatever else you have? Um, I'm so curious about your previous career as well. Do you feel like when you're facing a mom or even a student who's having, um, you know, a hard time. Do you feel like you approach it like you did an investigative <laughs> journalism position? Like you're asking the questions, you're taking notes. How do you feel like that's different or the same? Well, it, yeah, and it's funny that I've I've given a lot of thought to sort of. I, on the surface, I was like, oh, I'm making this big career shift and like I'm doing kind of a 180. But in a lot of ways, a lot of the skill sets are the same. I mean, and it comes from in me a really deep interest in people and their stories and kind of trying to give them a voice. Of course, as a journalist, you're giving them a voice and then sharing that voice in some way with their, your your readership. But, and in, in the therapy setting, it's all, it's all confidential. It's that would be illegal. <laughs> the therapy space. Yeah. Whether it's on zoom or in, in a therapy room, but I, yeah, I would say um, kind of approaching even if I think I have a good sense of what the answer is going to be, or I'm sensing a a pattern emerging, or I think, oh, I think I know where this story is going, trying to approach it really like uh, you're the expert of your own life and I'm here to draw out your story. So um, yeah, that that good note taking is, is a good skill, good active listening, I think, uh, corresponds to to success in in both fields but but yeah just kind of um coming in very aware of you know you you don't you may think you have an idea of what it's like to be in someone else's shoes but you absolutely do not know the full extent of it so let them tell you yeah I love that um I was especially surprised at how much I thought reading (laughs) and uh, being on the right blogs and talking to the right professional was going to prepare me for motherhood when it came down to the really hard moments I turned into my own mother. I've written a lot about that, but um, I'm curious to see how how the moms you've talked to and the experience that you've had, how much that, how relatable that is to other moms experience that they, they go back to learn behavior when they're parenting. Yeah. You know, I think that, I think that that's really, um, that's really common. And that like, we have those sort of trusted, um, whether it's sources of advice and wisdom or just kind of sounding boards when we're going through struggles. I, yeah, I have always found that to be for myself more, um, insightful, more personally applicable, more comforting than necessarily like you know, reading a really great parenting book. And there's some really great parenting books out there. But I think when I'm in a moment of struggle and really, you know, questioning multiple paths and and what's the right thing to do here, or something has really blindsided me, which, which can happen at any moment with kids. Um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I've, I've definitely gone back to my own mom. I've gone, um, to my mother-in-law, we've connected in that way about things. Um, and, you know, I have been fortunate that through different activities I've done when my kids especially were were babies and toddlers, you kind of meet mothers who are a little farther along in the journey than you are. And they're eager to pay it forward because some mom did that 
for them when they had a one-year-old and had no idea what to do. And the mom of a four-year-old said, oh, we went through something similar and maybe you don't follow this to the letter, but here's what worked for us or, or just validating what you're going through. That can be so comforting in and of itself. Yes. Or just taking the baby for five minutes. Oh yeah, that too. <laughs> just like, I guess uh, my, my next question would be um, what, how can you tell what, what the baby blues really are? How long should they last? Um, what's normal, what's a normal emotional imbalance and, and when should you seek help? Yeah. You know, um, I, I think that we, we talk about, we talk about the baby blues, not probably not as much, um, as we should. I think that there can be, um, there can be different ways that that can play out. I think we, we hear a little bit more about postpartum, depression than we do about postpartum anxiety, but that can be a very real experience for moms as well. I think, um, you know, it it's first of all, to normalize it, it's very common. And there you aren't, not only are you not alone if you're experiencing that, but you don't have to, you know, kind of white knuckle it or suffer in silence. There are options, whether that's receiving, you know, some support in the form of mental health counseling that specializes in the postpartum experience, or, you know, there are medications that are approved for breastfeeding moms. I think sometimes there's a concern about, you know, well, I assume I can't take any medication to help me through this, but all of that can be discussed with your OBGYN at the six-week postpartum visit. Usually, um, some some of those symptoms will often have have come up by them, but certainly I would encourage any mom who's struggling before that. Don't I mean, don't be a hero. Don't wait six weeks. That can feel like an eternity when you're not in sleeping the, in the newborn cycle. Yes. And yeah, so I would say um, I wish postpartum anxiety would get a little more attention because I know a lot of moms who have experienced that and sort of said, you know, I've I've heard with postpartum depression, there's almost a feeling of having some struggles, feeling really attached to the baby or feeling like maybe um, your emotions are very muted and I'm feeling the opposite. I'm feeling like terrified every time I'm away from the baby for five seconds and everything is heightened. And that's its own experience that should be addressed and kind of falls outside the realm of, you know, typical body and brain adjusting to having a baby. That's so great. That's so great that you recognize that and that you see that that is a separate thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you plan on doing when you're done uh, with the trainee experience? Well, you know, like I said, I wouldn't have thought necessarily that um, middle school was was a niche for me. But now that I have found it, I really hope to continue working with the adolescent population in in some capacity for for the way um, my my training process works. Once um, I graduate and I have finished my trainee year, I'm still. Uh, training as an associate, a clinical therapy associate for about another year before I take my my licensing exam. So I hope to continue exploring working with different populations. I'd love to work with some families or even some couples. I think that would be fascinating work. But I think, yeah, I think I've kind of found my my sweet spot with that, with that adolescent population. So I hope to find a way to continue that, whether it's at a school setting or maybe in, in private practice. But we'll see. If you if we get to check back in down the road, I may have completely changed my mind again. Well, we're checking again because you're going to join us again at the Bloom event next yeah, year. So thank you. you so much for being here. I'm going to connect our readers to all of your contact information at the bottom of this video. So if you're tuning in, thank you so much for watching and for joining us for this Bloom Expert panel with Robin Eden. Thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully we see you on Saturday in Walnut Creek at the Bloom event. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure.